Have you given any thought to contributing to The Melt? It's easy to do. Just click the Patreon link in the episode notes, and for as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus episodes, early access to regular episodes, and you can also participate in monthly Zoom meetups. It helps to keep the magic happening here at The Melt. So I encourage you to karmically entangle yourself with The Melt today by subscribing monthly for less than the price of a container of goatee wax, or a prosthetic pinky, or a half stick of DMT butter, or an inflatable casket, or the shrunken head of an Atlantean supermodel, or a woolly mammoth smirkin, or a crystalline replica of Baba Yaga's hut, or a capsule of Sasquatch dander. This is Hunter Muse. And this is Chris Snipes. And you are listening to The Melt. are we each willing to do to be free? How seriously do we take the concept of freedom? Better yet, what lengths are we willing to go to in order to experience true freedom? And how do we define freedom? The American Heritage Dictionary lists three definitions. One, the condition of not being in prison or captivity. Two, the condition of being free from restraints, especially the ability to act without control or interference by another or by circumstance. And three, the condition of not being controlled by another nation or political power. In the First Amendment of the Constitution, it states that, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. In this case, freedom of religion means freedom of thought and the actions that result from said thoughts. When we operate as self-aware living men and women, we are governed by our own inner moral compass, not by any institution that claims to have our best interests in mind. Freedom of speech and press are self-explanatory. These are the roots of expression all expression. Within the last few years, particularly within the last two, many in our communities have seen this violated. A sure sign of the presence of propaganda is censorship. We've had episodes pulled from YouTube and have had our entire podcast removed from Spotify. Many have had their channels shut down and have been shadow banned just for expressing themselves out of the narrative capital T, capital N. This is all unacceptable. Just because you might have 230 cable channels, 75 brands of breakfast cereal, 68 genders, and two fucking pathetic political parties to choose from, doesn't mean that you are anywhere remotely near being free. In our quest to explore the vast concept of personal freedom and autonomy, we decided to ask today's guest, Paul Enslaved, to come on the show and talk to us about how he sees it all. 
I start off the conversation by asking Paul how he got on this path. So yeah, I mean, basically, it's a it's kind of a lifelong process journey, if you want to call it that. Um, it starts off like a lot of the movies, uh, some trauma, you know, some uh, unexpected events, uh, mainly with my mother, you know, having a stroke when I was born. Uh, she was supposed to die. I was supposed to die. Um, out of that came a lot of uh, fear and confusion and inability to relate, you know, mm-hmm. within myself and, and to her and then later on in life to women in general. So a lot of the, the, the upbringing for me was a lot of fear, pain, confusion. Um, and again, like they say, you know, the crack is where the light enters. The Tao is dark and radiant if you let it be. So a lot of times, you know, and then I go back to the Phoenix has to crash and burn before it rises higher. So I sit on the other side now and I realize that, you know, a, a good majority of my life, like people say, oh, you didn't have an easy, you had a hard life. I don't choose to look at it that way. I think, uh, life taught me certain things, you know, gave me certain lessons. And the best way for me to learn, fortunately or unfortunately, however you uh, look at it, is through pain and suffering. And I find that to be pretty ubiquitous across the board you know when we see humanity right now uh you know humanity in quotes that's a whole other word we can get into but uh you know it seems that the majority of us don't learn and don't evolve until we're put through a certain amount of pain and suffering so that's pretty much how i got onto the path of searching for a way to conduct myself right it started out with i didn't feel good within myself i have to seek some form of truth or understanding to change my inner space right and along that way it started to encompass different i guess principles understandings fields uh um, arts if you want to call it that i mean people consider it different things but it's all kind of on the journey to becoming a best version of self right psychology sociology uh, understanding history uh, words and terms symbology Yes. So, you know, along the along the experience, the journey of 33 years, probably starting um, around, I'd say, 16 through 18, Mm -hmm. I started to really awaken to something was wrong within me and and intuitively with the world, I guess, if you want to call it that or just society in quotes, right, society in general. And yeah, from that time till now. Um, it's been crystallizing more and more who and what I am, what I'm here to do, and uh, what the world is here to teach me. I like it. Yeah. And, and as this work uh, seems to keep telling us, you, you really have to, if you want to, I mean, not that I'm not saying that you're out to change the world, but for those who are, you got to start with yourself. You got you to gotta clean your own house before you go uh, imposing that on, on the external Absolutely. This scripture, uh, one of the passages, cast the plank out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out of another. So, you know, that leads us back to the idea, like you said, if you want to change the world, you got to start with yourself. Because one of the failings of, of mankind, another interesting word is we're always using the five senses to look outwardly into the world and try to change something, control something, you know, manipulate something in order to get a better outcome it's very subtle and deceptive right because the biggest change most powerful change comes from within you know, it sounds cliche but it's absolutely true right on the on the journey to mastery you know the the, the truest form of mastery is self-mastery right that's a battle no one can take from you and it's not going absolutely so you mentioned um really bravely and i i commend you for that um early childhood trauma and it sounds like there was even some birth trauma that you had how did you reconcile that and how did your mom reconcile that did she come out from the other side of that stroke what was what was the the uh result of that so she was she basically had her speech and (laughs) physicality reduced you know half her body didn't work and her her speech and and her cognition was severely impaired she pretty much spent all of my childhood drinking 
you know, watching television and drinking pretty much not really being involved with me or, or life in general, because, you know, they'll use different words for it. She had depression, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's a lot for a being to go through that stuff. And, you know, that became a, a theme in my life to cope with the whole situation was drugs. You know, her thing was alcohol. But yeah, I mean, there wasn't reconciliation. There wasn't resolution that was part of what created the resistance, the confusion, you know, that energy in motion, that emotion was nobody was seeking and searching for resolution and reconciliation. So, you know, a lot of coping mechanisms, drugs and alcohol, mainly, you know, I, I've told it before, but I was a IV heroin addict at one point, you know, mm -hmm. for about uh, eight years or more. Um, you know, I'm not really good with the time. I don't ever sit down and think this stuff out and figure it all out. But I know that I started sniffing heroin around 19 years old and I, I, I started shooting it very shortly after. It's just part of what happens sure. with that stuff. Anyone who has any experience knows uh, that's how it goes. And that continued for, you know, a good, what, seven to nine years. I think it was 26, 27. Um, so whatever that is. Yeah. And then I, I, you know, jails, rehabs, the whole deal. And, uh, yeah, forced to look at myself, look within, become response able, account able, you know, trustworthy, <clears throat> because I was lacking in all those areas, right? Self esteem, self worth. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit windy, and you know, for the for the listeners, uh, I'm now at a you know, in the air quotes, right? I'm at an off grid property, even though it actually is. I mean, it's uh, it's the new phrase now, so. I don't want people to think that it's about being trendy. I'm not doing all creating because it's trendy. I'm doing it because I want to create my own power. I want to grow my own food. I want my own source of water. Yeah, I'm weird like that. You know, I want to be self-sufficient and not bound and controlled by outside influence. I, I think the fascinating uh, yeah, part is restricted activity. I think the, the fascinating part about what your origin story encompasses is that in many regards, you were outside of the system um, because you didn't grow up in what could be considered like a traditional family uh, experience, whatever that is. That seems kind of that's a broad term, but it, in some ways that seems to have laid the groundwork for your interest in sovereignty because it seems from my perspective it seems like the the system didn't work for you and whether that be the parental system or the family unit the system that you were born into wasn't one that was bolstering or supporting you uh to move forward in your life and so it, it seems like it was easy for you to fall down these rabbit holes of drugs um, and the kind of alternate uh, lifestyles because the regular life in quotes didn't really wasn't supporting you. So can you talk a little bit about that transition? You mentioned that you did have some run ins with the police prior to this. Do you think that that inspired you to seek out more information about being a free, sovereign human? Yeah, I mean, I've had different uh, experiences along the way, one of which was at that time starting to experiment uh, in court. You know, I think that the spirit, I can't, I can't really speak on, you know, anybody else's spirit and how that moves, but I know that when I look back on it, there was always something a little bit different when it came to the spirit. I mean, they tell me from day one, you know, they were calling me wild man in the, in the, in the birthing area, if you want to call it that birthing. Right. But where yeah. I was born, you know, it's, it's there's something about that. I've had a reverend who was 90 something years old in rehab go, you know, every once in a while, somebody's born under a sign or whatever, however he put it, you know, and, and I don't like to think that way because it's not about me being special. So it's about us addressing insecurities, right? Because like they say, if you want to learn how to do something right, learn how to do it wrong first. But the problem is in life is the culture, as you, you were alluding to, people think it works for them. And because right. things go on for so long and the status quo is maintained, people think this stuff works for them. 
It's right. the person who becomes extremely aware of their humanity, their insecurity, the, the lack of self-sustainability. That is a being who is now opened up to the, possi- to, the, to the idea of possibilities and potential, right? It doesn't have to be a scary negative thing. It can be when you're going through it. But again, that's the, the difference between seeking truth and seeking comfort. Most folks will ignore a bunch of insecurities in their life. It, it's almost like you said, uh, a lot of times we have to have our quote unquote heart broken or our ego checked or just have our consciousness and awareness drawn to the fact of how much we don't know or we don't understand or how much things are not working for us. We don't have principles and foundation to lean on. We have a bunch of family members and systems, hierarchical, right? familial and and societal and that is one of the the downfalls i believe i just i feel like you you covered something that's really important in all of this and it is is the fact that some people are are kind of placated or numbed into compliance when they grow up in a very easy life where where the system doesn't seem to be uh, constraining or confining them in any way. And so it's easy to comply because you're not really confronted by anything. So in, in some regards, I think that your childhood was a blessing because it kind of puts you on this outside of consensus reality. And uh, by the, just by the very nature of how you were raised, you were kind of put into a position to question reality. And what do you, do you feel like that, that speaks any truth to your, your circumstance? Yeah, absolutely. There's sort of this way that I, I see it where at first, um, you know, like they say, we'll use the cliche, the rebel without a cause, right? Somebody who's just at war with themselves, something they haven't dealt with or made right. And it causes them to act out. Now, when you come from this perspective, obviously there's a functional, I'm not going to use the term rebellion uh, necessarily, but um, what I'm getting at here is the idea perspective and you do the full circle, you start to realize that it's not uh, 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 the individual who follows his own path right, and discovers or creates himself by learning to uh, firsthand experience. That is not the rebel. The rebels are those who continue to live in these cultural, and I love the root word of that, cult. You have to point that out. You know, I'll do it a million times if I have to. Um, these, cult, these cultural um, paradigms that we all grow up in and have to live in and conform to are the antithesis of co-creation with the supernatural, right? I, mm-hmm. I like to, to, to use the pronunciation of the word to really get it home to the mind and heart what we're talking about here. This is not a mystical experience. It's supernatural. You know, means in and of co-creating with nature. The majority of cultures on the earth subscribe to certain tenets. It makes them anti-life, right? To live backward is spelled E-V-I-L, right? So, to live backward is evil. This is all we're, we're describing and trying to get an understanding uh, to ourselves and, and to folks about is this idea of you can live with the supernatural or you can live backward with your cultural man-made ideas of how the world works and try to remake the world in your own image. One will create a kingdom of heaven. The other will create a hell on earth. We're seeing it now, right? If one were to come out here and see me with the plants and, and the, the weather and, and the animals that I'll bring up here and co-create with, with rather than enslave and destroy for my own quote-unquote survival, it's the closest thing you're going to get to security and a kingdom of heaven while we're here, right? And there's nothing mystical or, or otherworldly about it. Co-creating with what we have and not controlling, destroying, dominating or going in resistance to what is in order to feel some form of security, which is what a lot of us are doing in the modern day world. And it's a false sense of security because you're not really secure 
if you are not sovereign in your own being and you're not living in in a sense of your own um, totality. I, I think that's one of the confusions that some people have about the, this, the idea of sovereignty and natural law and universal law is this idea that, well, we have laws written on the books and those are the laws that govern us as human beings, but they're, they're not really uh, constitutional laws. That, I mean, we've seen that in the past two years. That, that So let's touch on this real quick. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just want to clarify before I forget, for anybody who's listening, we need to make distinguish, uh, distinguishing remarks about what this all is. Yes. There's statute, policy, and code on the book, yes, which is only given the force of law through the consent of the governed as per the Declaration of Independence. So what folks don't know, the little secret, and now this is why I don't use the term sovereign. I don't need to use it anyway. I don't necessarily like the term. I think sentient is a better term because they're now taking the word sovereign and creating a movement out of it. You're a sovereign citizen yes, and all this. If we really understand what is going on here, and I guess we can go into this if you'd like, the idea of people versus person, right? Yeah. How the Constitution speaks to we the people versus you summoning to appear in person. Mm -hmm. They're not the same thing. The law is expressed. It's not implied. The ignorance of the law is no excuse. Right. Right. So all you have to do is go to any law dictionary and you'll understand the confusion is happening because folks are identifying as citizens and then wanting their sovereignty. So that is a, 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 a proper terminology they use on folks like that, right? If you contract in and you agree to certain duties, obligations, and responsibilities, whether you know it or not, you filled out the paper, you signed your name, follow the code, right? So you cannot be a sovereign citizen just by definition. Right. Now you can identify or present because we don't want to identify as anything other than what we are. So we have to present as a man on the land, right? There's the state of Arizona and Arizona state. They're two very different things. One is a corporate body politic, a fictitious entity, a metaphysical entity, a black and white on paper entity. And then there is Arizona State, right? The state of is the corporation. They'll say you're in the state of, it's a, it's a state of being, versus Arizona State, right? There's two senators for each state because one body governs the land and one body governs the corporate body politic. The politicians will call the unspoken social contract. So if folks would correct their status and standing and stop identifying as members of the body politic, the demosocracy, corporate United States of America in all capital letters with their all caps person, right? They would stop identifying in capacity. They would not have to follow the encode because as I said, it's not me overthrowing or rebelling against God's law, the law of the land. Ironically, I've come from rebellion to resolution. The only way out of this is to uphold uh, God's law, universal law, and what we call constitutional law. But first, we have to truly understand it, right? Not think that we understand it and make all this on paper showing that we don't. So what, what is the difference between natural law and universal law, or is there a difference at all? So again, a lot of this, I, I guess, you know, no, no one can claim to completely know what universal law would be from the perspective of the universe, yeah, sure. right? We can't know the Tao or the universe or God, but we can be it to a degree, right? Mm -hmm. We can understand true enough. So to me, an example of like a universal law would be anywhere that I go in the world, pretty much other than completely, again, dysfunctional, imbalanced, usually male dominator, ego societies, I can go anywhere I want and do whatever I please as long as I'm not causing any loss, injury, or harm. And if somebody tries to interfere with me and my right to seek property and happiness without causing loss, injury, and harm, they are a wrongdoer. You know, and the reason why this quote-unquote movement, it's not a movement, it's a state of understanding. It's a state of being in consciousness. Mm -hmm. The reason it's taking off everywhere is because humans innately, inherently, their spirit yearns to be free and make their own choices and decisions. Oftentimes we know we're being misled by our own mind and our own brain chemistry at times, right? But the, the, the human 
feared, especially in times like we are in now where everything is, is being forced to be questioned because the dark forces have completely brought the inversion reality out into the open, mm-hmm. right? So it, it's a perfect, um, it's a perfect state of affairs. That's why I always say everything is as it should be. And I'll say, oh, he's a dark Mason because he's saying that this evil should be allowed to exist and whatever. I'm not the arbiter of the universe. Yeah. Evil and good has always and will always exist here. What are we doing to co-create a kingdom of heaven here? And the answer when I ride up and down the highways is little to nothing because everyone's got their license to move their property. Right. Everyone's got their license to carry their firearm. Right. Everyone's got their medical license to carry God's plans. Every single one of them have signed on with the Akashic Record yeah. as followers of man's code over universal law and conscience, which was given to them at their creation. They've rebuked the creational conscience and common sense within all of us. That's why they say common sense is no longer common. And now they're followers of man and man's law, and they will be obviously put into suffering and death. People perish for lack of knowledge of self and the universe. Well, you brought up an interesting point because a a lot of what the police operate with and by is probable cause. So if you're driving down a highway and you don't have a, a license plate, for example, what they are going to say, and th- I'm conjecting here, what they're going to say is that they have probable cause to stop you, even though you are not doing anything that uh, is intended to cause harm to anyone. You, you are. What, what was your, what was your name again? I just want to make sure that I have your name in my head. Hunter. Hunter. That's right. Hunter. So that's exactly the point, right? that part of common law is when you live in a country where everybody believes the slavery, it's now become commonplace and common law that you must display a plate. So when you don't, it's presumed and assumed, right? That's what we go. Presume presumption, assumption, yep. tacit agreement and hearsay. Mm-hmm. So it's presumed and assumed that if you're not displaying some kind of plate, something must be up because everyone else does it. It's common law. Yeah. Right. Right. So what, I mean, what kind of, do you have any sort of plate or place marker or anything on your vehicle? Yeah. So I was, I was running the private plate, um, which again, I've had a positive experience that's lodged. I've had quote unquote negative experience. I don't choose to look at it that way because it only gets me better at what I'm doing. So currently when I move my property around, I use a USDOT plate right, where I have recorded with the USD, USDOT that I am a private carrier of non-commercial goods for non-commercial use. So one could say that I'm recorded with the federal agency. However, I am not subject to any of the codes and policies because under the recording, I am an unlicensed mover of private property, a private carrier, which again, if we go to the federal definitions and I want someone, anyone, anywhere to just come to me and tell me why the definitions of words vary from federal to state to local laws. How does that happen? Why is it allowed to continue? And does everyone believe that that's okay? Because if we can't come to an understanding of words and terms and what they mean objectively, then we're living in bizarre world yeah. because it's whatever they say it is. So right. under the federal, right, which is supposed to be a superior form of law to state and local, right, checks and balances, the mm-hmm. feds are not above being checked either, which is why we can grow reefer and smoke it because we've decided that in the pursuit of property, property and happiness that the federal code does not apply to us. That's legitimate. What you can't do is take local and state law, override the federal protections that are there in U.S. code to protect us from false obligations and securities, which they're generating on the side of the road. If you go read the U.S. code, it's deprivation of rights under color of law and about 10 other things. Those codes are not by accident. They're put there to protect us. That's our remedy outside of local and state courts, who a lot of which want to run a a, a RICO, right? They want to get together. They want to conspire to deprive folks of rights. But again, I can't completely blame them because we're back to every single slave has a license in their pocket. 
Every single slave has their private property registered as state property. Every single, and see now they'll get mad at me and say, you shouldn't be calling people slaves. Well, see, when I, when I call out on one side what the agents and agency do, because they know damn well that this is fraud and that this isn't legitimate contract and none of these slaves know what they've gotten themselves into. It's all misrepresentation. They go along with it because, again, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Let he who wish to be deceived be deceived. These are maxims in law. Mm-hmm. So, again, we have a sort of uh, black robe, grim reaper, dark force, shy con mirror of the light in order to get us right because these folks would not ever take on full accountability and responsibility if it wasn't someone there literally forcing them into contract and giving them these word games and forcing them to go look at who and what they are and what they keep showing up for and having to answer to why are they not accountable to the most high right so i love the whole game and and how it all works and uh yeah i kind of got off there Um, If you want to kind of refocus me a little bit. Well, I think one of the arguments would be jurisdiction. So if you are in, let's say you're in, I lived in Arizona for a while. Let's say I was in Tempe, Arizona, and I got in trouble with local police. The feds are not going to come in and... Um, be involved in a case that involves me unless I've, I've committed what is considered a federal crime. Sure. But you could sue in federal court though. No, that's why a lot of these yes. folks go to superior court and then Supreme court because right. they, the, the locals are, are, are corrupt, right? It's all a money generating scheme that they misread the code or they're mistrained to read the code. A lot of these folks are not actively waking up every day and saying, I'm going to fraud people today. They have 10, 15, 20 years in believing, like you just said, that jurisdiction means the place you're at rather than the Latin, which is jurisdiction means to say the law. So you can only have jurisdiction if somebody consents because it literally means to say the law. It's a form of contracting. So they'll say, <coughs> you watch what they do. They'll walk up the first three things they want, license, registration, insurance. Those are forms of contract. That's how they get jurisdiction. Because the law is on paper that's spoken or written on paper and you've consented to it. Now, a lot of them don't understand this. They'll believe, right, or they've been trained that jurisdiction means a place on the map. But we're not talking about Arizona State. We're talking about the state of Arizona. Right. It's a corporate body. It's a corporate entity. So they will say, in the state of. Now, why do they choose these words? See, this is what I always love. People say, you're making things up. You think this is accidents or mistakes? Oh, you're in the state of Colorado right now, right? Yeah, sure. Great. Now we have jurisdiction because you just agreed to what we said that you're in something right now. Right. Are you on the land known as Colorado or are you in the state of Colorado? Right. In the state of something means it's a part of your being. So that's how they get you. It's words and terms and sorcery. Now, again, do most agents know this? Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. They just know they're trained to walk up and ask for certain things and then reconfer with their superior. And the head solicitor prosecutor, he knows the game. He knows how it all works. I'm on the phone with them where they play the words with me. I'll say, you're a man, right? No, I'm an adult male. Well, I can't interact or intercourse with you because you're not of the same species. An adult male is an animal. That's how you describe an animal. You know, go look at it in, in, in words and terms. Masculine and feminine uh, applies to humans. Male, female applies to animal, cattle, chattel which is what we're considered, right? So they can't interact with man and woman. They can only interact with other agent and agencies, other fictitious entity. That's why they call out the all cat thing, appear as a person. Oh, are you this person? Yeah, sure. Now you just put on a mask, your agent and agency, because a person under U.S. code is considered either a natural person or a legal person. That all caps name is not a natural person. It's capitus diminutio maxima. It's the maximum diminishment of your capacity. It means you've been, you've been turned from a representative of the most high into a corporate entity. So under the U S code, if people would just go look at this, when you're appearing in person, you're being summoned like an entity, a dead entity to appear in person, a legal person, not a natural person. So you've given up your right status and standing, and now they're going to drag you around the room. And who do they call the prosecutor, the agent across the room for you? Well, he's the people, right? Of course, 
because they have to reverse the role. You're appearing as agent and agency with duties, responsibilities, and obligations, code, statute, and policy, which has only ever been written to govern government agencies, never man, woman, and that government say we're the people and we're here with all the benefits and and rights and we're going to drag you around the room so because of the of the nature of how we appear and the status and standing in which we appear in court is why we lose and why the people who are supposed to serve us serve the corporate body because of how we've appeared or presented right they'll call it you need representation so where does the what is the real meaning of identification in this context How, how do you lose your rights in regards to id well, if I walked up to you and I said, will you and everyone's doing it nowadays? See, see, if you notice, these conditions in a courtroom carry over to everything in life because you are who you are in anything you do and everything you do. It's just to what degree. So now you have folks, I'm identifying as a woman, I'm identifying as a man, I'm identifying as a dog. We're in the age of identifying as something other than what you are. So yeah. they'll say, you will identify. It means you will take on a persona, a mask. That's what persona means in Latin, a mask. You will wear a mask. You will take on an identity. You will cloak yourself as man and woman because we know we can't regulate man and woman. We can, however, regulate persons, right? So we can't regulate people, but we can regulate persons because under U.S. code, there's two persons. You're presumed to be a legal person when you contract as that all capital letters name until you correct your status as the representative of that legal person. I have a legal person, but I will not identify as it. I use it, but I am not it. I am the man. Mm-hmm. So what, I mean, personally, what do you use as, or do you have any sort of ID? Some people, I know that Mr. I have credential. Okay. I have credential, right? That's the difference between identification and a credential. My credential describes who and what I am. I'm a man. Here's when I was born. Your identification describes how they turned you from a man into a corporation. You were birthed. They birthed them at the dock like a vessel, and they created a corporate persona, a mask, that you've now done business as everywhere you've gone. And you've contracted to take on obligations and duties of that person, which is bound by code, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's the purpose of, of, of teaching everyone to go down and make these contracts and agreements and sign their name and not know how to do it correctly. And then when they identify as the person, well, now we have 11.4 million things we can govern you with. Does it make sense? Common sense in the sense of code and policy and statute was only ever there to govern agent. Right. Man and woman is governed by law, God's law. So it's innate. It's part of our conscience. We know not to lie, cheat, steal and murder. But because we've become so fallen and reprobate where we lie, cheat, steal, and murder on a day-to-day basis, a force has had to come in to govern our behavior because we've not learned how to govern ourselves. That's what people talk about sovereignty. I don't like the word. It's about governing the self. Do you think the average public can govern themselves? They show every single day that they're not capable and unwilling to, right? Maybe they're capable, they're unwilling to, right? And I know firsthand because I could be out in the middle of nowhere and someone's going to call up and complain on me rather than come over and have a conversation with you. Exactly. They're going to appeal to authority as opposed to have a direct interaction with you. Because it's, it's more difficult to take on full accountability and responsibility. Mm-hmm. You, you don't like what's going on over there? Change it. Yeah. Nah, we want to sit back, do nothing, be nothing. Call somebody else up that we supposedly pay for to come handle our issues for us. And you wonder why they're going to handle them all right, because you can't govern yourself. You've, rep- you've represented yourself as a child. That's what they'll talk about. Uh, wards in the state, you know, the person is another one, a minority. You have a lot of folks standing up who have, have different skin tones, and they will identify as a minority, and they will do it proudly. Hey, I'm a minority. I have civil rights. Great. You just gave those rich people, uh, 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 however you want to look at it, right, because it's not about class warfare, but you just gave the aristocracy complete jurisdiction over you because a minority is the same thing as a child. It's a ward of a state, right? A minor minority. So they've given us these words and terms to parrot and repeat so we can give up all of our status and standing. You know, go look at the Moors, different cultures who will say, I'm not a part of your culture and your society. You know, look at me and how I dress and look at my culture and understand that I ride with God's law. So in court, they win all the time. And people, a lot of times on my YouTube, they'll bash me and yell at me. They'll say, this guy's out here teaching false stuff. He's going to get a lot of people hurt. 
I'm not telling people to do anything other than follow their heart and their spirit, right? And understand the difference between legal and lawful. Yeah, they're still stuck in that dichotomy of being told, like, you're you're there saying, preaching what people should do when in, in, you're doing the exact opposite. You're wanting people to do their own research, and sovereignty isn't about listening to somebody else and going, that sounds like a great idea, I think I'll do it. You know, yeah, yeah, it doesn't work That's that way. That's what got us into this mess, you know, the, the follower culture. You see on all the media nowadays, everybody's so proud to be a follower. Oh, he's, everyone's following everybody right? Who's leading, right? And then they talk about making America great again. How can you have America great again when it's populated by people who aren't good, let alone great, right? And and then we have to get back to what do these words and terms mean? What is goodness? What is greatness? You know, what makes a man or woman great throughout history and throughout the ages? It's only a certain set of things. I don't care who they are and where they're from. It's a set of principles and understanding that that being embodies, right? Sure. So do you think that government is, is an appropriate institution for those who aren't aware of even the concept of sovereignty? That's the thing is that it, this is all cause and effect. Um, if you demonstrate, which people can no longer get mad at me and hate on me, all you have to go do is look at the numbers. Men lie, women lie, numbers don't. The numbers will tell the tale how many folks, and I don't know if we're quote unquote, allowed to talk about it, but that's part of the problem in America is we're now not allowed to talk about certain things on certain platforms. But, you know, we'll speak in a sense of where everyone knows what we're talking about without addressing it directly. Over the last two years, you've seen everybody, not everybody, I don't want to make complete extreme statements. You've seen the vast majority of folks around the world sell their ability to choose, their ability to think for themselves, and their ability to co-create with a higher level of consciousness for another day of security within the system, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a bunch of folks who have demonstrated, said, if I could die tomorrow, these folks are on record now. The last two years was a test. Can you govern yourself and your own affairs in the face of challenges and adversity and fears? And the answer is no. As soon as you get challenges, adversity, and fears, you slave right up. You look for the, the closest code book or the closest agent. OK, you, you, you start repeating words like mandate when mandate and civil law means a request because you don't even know enough to look into the words you're using because you're completely unconscious. This is all about consciousness and awareness. How many words and terms we use day in and day out don't understand what they mean and where they come from. And then people are parroting and taking my rights. It's on video on my YouTube, taking my rights everywhere I go, interfering with my rights. Right. Because they don't understand the meanings of words in terms. If you're willing to believe absurdities, you will commit atrocities. When did our public servants in America become our controllers and dictators when we let them? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, You got anything? No. Um, Let's see. What is, uh, it's another term that's thrown around in the sovereign community. If there is such a thing, I just, for the, (laughs) for the sake of the conversation, what is maritime law? Okay. So this is, from my understanding, would be the law of the sea of other folks equate law. It's commerce. Cause like, okay, I'll give you the term. They'll say you're trafficking and transporting. Mm Mm-hmm. So we're talking about commercial maritime law, essentially, where they're saying you're violating transportation code because we're back to the day when we got birth at the dock. That's what they call when they put a ship in its birth at the dock Mm -hmm. for, right? And they give you a birth certificate and they've created a commercial vessel. So it's the same way they'll talk about your vehicle. It's the same idea. It's a vessel. So we're using essentially maritime words and terms Because a lot of this stuff, I guess, goes back to the time when folks started moving around in vessels on the water and there wasn't law of the land to govern them and keep them. There had to be some code, right? Like they'll talk about in the Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, your boy there, he's now up in court every day. That's the biggest news for everybody. But, you know, he'll get on there and he'll talk about the code parlay, right? Because there had to be a code established to govern men and women who were moving about lying, cheating, stealing, taking property that wasn't theirs, on and on and on. So again, 
a lot of this stuff comes out of trying to keep order where there is chaos and then it, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Then it just turns into a business of, okay, you know, we're going to do business here or come past these lines. We're going to tax you and take something from you if you don't contract with us because everything is an offer, right? You can go anywhere, any paperwork or anytime they give you a paper and tell you to sign, they're making an offer. Yeah, yeah. You're agreeing to contract, right? So mm-hmm. Under UCC 1308, I believe, which has been adopted as interstate law uh, nationwide, it says you cannot be forced in any contract, right? So that is commercial law. That is maritime law, whatever you want to call it. And it governs all these people and these service providers. And they'll say, UCC is not law. Well, it actually is. It's a uniform commercial code so that it governs all of our interactions commercially with doing business. That's what banking or benching is the judge sits on a bench which is latin for bank and they're doing commerce they're generating bonds and security right so when we understand that this is all about commerce and banking and and how we present versus represent and and realize that um yeah there is a level of this of folks who beg for this system and want this system and i've come to the place going from hating it to understanding that it may as well be necessary. So I let the slaves who want to be regulated under corporate policy, they can have that. And I, when I choose to stand as a man and embody my natural rights, I have that right in this country, thank God. And I wish for that to be upheld. upheld excuse me. And so in this system too, we are seen as merchandise also, right? Well, that's the thing, right? Uh, And people will talk about the birth certificate. The birth certificate can be a good thing. It it can be a negative thing. The Bible can be a good thing. It can be a negative thing. It's about the perception of the wielder and the user, right? If you birth someone and you create a vessel, that can be great. Now, I can take all physical liability and tie it to my commercial liability, and I just pay on it. Oh, we had an accident. Somebody got harmed. Cool. I'll just pay off. We'll compensate to the best of our ability as long as it's not malicious. As long as I didn't wake up that morning and say, I'm going to kill somebody, accidents happen. So I'll take on the commercial liability through my person and I'll pay it off over the rest of my life rather than you hang me in town square. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. it can work for us. It can also work against us because if you don't have the legal person, if you identify as the legal person, then you've essentially created a surety bond between your physical form, you know, your, your natural person and the legal person. So now the man has taken on that commercial liability and they'll put you in a cage to extract that value from you. Because again, privatized prison is about taking the product, warehousing it, and then collecting a revenue of keeping that product there based on taxpayer money, which I guess, um, uh, I guess at some point we've, we've crossed the bridge between public and private. And that's sort of the issue, right? Is we're, we're all mixing public and private law. You know, a man is supposed to be a private man in his private affairs and uphold the law. And we're now mixing uh, the law with what's legal and public, right? Public policy. So it is one of the main goals of sort of disengaging from the system is to stay away from any sort of contractual uh, interaction with the system, like not signing anything. Okay, so I'll give you an example. You have, and this is the problem as you go look at the paperwork and then they'll tell me, well, Paulie's not accepting everything that's put forth just as it's put forth. Yeah, I'm weird like that. I don't just accept everything that's put put forth. I come to my own determination and understanding. So again, this is part of the whole idea of you can't try a man and said that he says that, say that he does wrong if he really believes in his heart what he's saying and doing. That's where the word conviction comes from. I have a conviction in my heart. So you can't convict me if I didn't believe that I was doing wrong. So Refocus me there again. I got off a little bit because there's so many words and terms that I kind of want to cover, man. I just started it off by by asking if one of the main uh, uh, ways of of navigating all this is to avoid any kind of contractual interaction with the system. Okay. So you go look at the birth certificate, right? There'll be two dates on there and they'll call, they'll, they'll, they'll probably use birth somewhere in both. One is a birth date, one is a birth registration date. As far as I'm concerned, there's a born date and a birth date, right? So your born date is that date they call your birth date. Your birth registration date, that's your birth date, right? So you have a born date and you have a birth date. There was a date when you, the man was created or came into the world, not even created. He's been there already for nine months, however long. But 
the man has now come into the world on the born day. And then a month later, a week later, however long later, the person was created. That's the birthday. So when you present a credential, you should not be showing a picture of your happy face and a birthday, right? Mm -hmm. Which is your born day. Yeah. I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is making any sense to you, but like you should have, you should have a credential as a man and then you should have a legal person, which you use to do legal business. You should not be presenting a legal person as who and what you are, right? So when we go and fill out and do the paperwork, well, then you should be giving the birth registration date. You shouldn't be giving your born date. So there's a lack of understanding, as far as I'm concerned, of record keeping. Because now when you go to access that account to charge me, right, just like you would any other account, I'm going to charge you with this, this, and this from this code. Um, you're charging the legal person, not the man. Right. Because I've given you I've given you a credential. So either you're going to you're either going to charge the legal person and I'm going to represent that. Right. I'm the authorized representative, just like a credit card holder. Or you're going to charge the man, in which case I'm going to be held in one jurisdiction or the other commercial or common law constitutional. The problem is we're mixing jurisdictions. Right. Because you're showing a man on the card. And you're putting down the legal person's birthday. And then they're handing you paperwork and saying, well, you just sign right here. When you come out of court, go look at it. There's two people there. There's, there's upper lowercase name. And then on the other side, it will say all caps name. They're asking you to sign as a man to connect yourself with the legal person. That's what a surety bond is. They want you to perform and be obligated as a man for what they're claiming the person did. See, it's all about words and terms, games, and again, jurisdiction to say the law and mixing public and private jurisdiction. How did you ask any ask any judge, quote unquote, magistrate? I don't mean to cut you off. Ask any no, magistrate sorry. when you go in there. How many jurisdictions does this court preside over? They'll tell you, like they told me in Colorado, we have administrative, which basically means commercial, and we have common law slash constitutional. One governs men and women, which there's very little to talk about because unless I cause loss, injury, and harm, you, you can't govern me. Right. So um, there's one that governs man and woman and there's one that governs legal persons. It's about how you appear and how you present. And if you're represented by somebody else, you definitely ain't a man or woman because man or woman doesn't ever let another man or woman talk for them when they have firsthand knowledge. They present themselves completely honorably, respectfully, truthfully and unwavering. Are there any states that are, are more common law friendly than others? We want to believe so. If you ask everybody, they'll say, oh, this state's the worst, this state's the best. I've been pretty much all over, and what I would say is there's a common theme anywhere you go. Um, there may be pockets where the culture just sort of hasn't died off. It may tend to be in places, you know, it's kind of common sense, where people are still living on the land. They're still having to be responsible and accountable for themselves. There's still men and women out there, right? There's not a bunch of corporate, inauthentic males and females who don't know who and what they are, what their place in this world is, other than a cubicle serving someone else's purpose and vision, right? So when you get back to the land, ironically enough, there seems to be more of this idea of, of value systems, principles, and interpersonal, dare I use the word person, right? But for colloquial reasons, interpersonal relationships. They care about how they're seen by the other men and women in the community and, and you know, vice versa. So. Um, but yeah, like anything else, you know, we're in a time now where this culture, this cult has pervaded all, uh, people and places and everywhere you go, pretty much everyone's under the same belief that statute policy and code is a governing body for them in their life. And also in rural, more rural places too, people are more of a cohesive community. They're more apt to know each other, to have grown up around each other, to know each other's relatives so that that makes for a rec more recognition of humans, whereas in a maybe a bigger, larger city, people are more auto or not autonomous, anonymous, and they lose track of the natural order of things because they're dealing with all these false, fake entities that just see them as statistics and numbers and nothing personal whatsoever, not anything remotely resembling a human being. 
Well, that's part of the thing, right? Is that like what you put out is what you get back. So you have this cycle of everybody pretty much on a reward system like Pavlov uh, teaching them that every time that they tow the inauthentic line and do what's against their intuition or their conscience, they get a little reward and a bump up. See, that's the counterintuitive part of how this system all allows folks who reject their mind and heart and their own self to rise to the top, right? That's why a lot of times, you know, people will blame the system. I don't blame the system, but I can analyze it and see the failings and the weakness in it. And we can argue over whether it's done on purpose or not. It doesn't really much matter because I will say once again, if it is done on purpose, it's still a good thing because from what I've seen, men and women are not going to present themselves as men and women and do what's true and what's right and go past their fears until it gets bad enough, whatever that means to the individual, just like me. I wouldn't get off the heroin and stop overdosing until I finally, you know, hit rock bottom, as they say, right? When it gets bad enough where you really start to re take account of your life and how you got there and where you're going and what this all means. But, you know, as long as that gravy train is moving, as long as that paycheck and pension's coming in, as long as everybody continues to get validation for observing the policy and code rather than observing universal law, what's true and what's right, what's equitable, what's trustworthy, because we can get into how this is all about trust. That's another concept, another form of law. It's all the same deal. You know, the trust is broken when the servants stop serving and start controlling and dominating. They swore to uphold God's law. That's part of their oath and affirmation, right? But again, we're in a culture nowadays where an oath to God doesn't really mean much. Exactly. It's about that Molech and that mammon, right? It's about that bottom line numbers on paper. Well, but it's also interesting that this is something that people have just been indoctrinated into. So when you, let's say you have a child in a hospital, they don't really give you the option to have a birth certificate or not. You, There's you, always an option. Right, but, even right, but people don't people don't understand that they can exercise that option. So if you go into well, an, an institution, there's this idea that you have to uh, comply with the paperwork. You have to go. So th- what's the root of that? What's the root of that? Uh, I think it's spiritual laziness. I, I just think it's it's a lack of um, critical thinking skills. People don't push back. It's like, oh, like, like I had a family member who had a, a baby in a hospital and the baby was immediately low jacked. Like they put, they put a security monitor on the child. Literally the second he came out of the womb, he was immediately cuffed. And the idea was like, well, this is so that no one steals your baby. Because right. p- people walk into the hospital all the time, walk into... Uh, maternity wards and they'll literally steal a child so they put this this cuff on the baby's ankle so that if they start if someone takes the child and tries to get the child out of the maternity ward the doors lock in front of them and police are called immediately wow so the first so, so the first introduction to this child's life is immediately having a shackle on their ankle. Sure. Just like um, we do with our animals day to day. And this is something that I talk about more frequently. And, you know, there's people who understand this and they're thankful that I bring forth this perspective. And there's other people who they can't stand it. But the same way that we've been treating animals for a very long time is the way that we're now being treated because we've identified as animals with the words and terms, whether we know it or not. Right. What is a mankind? kind of like a man, not really, it's some kind of beast. Mm-hmm. So um, when we get back to, see, you, you, I had a, I had a, that's why a lot of times I'll interrupt and, and, and I, I come off like I'm cutting you off or being rude. No, no. I, I get an idea on something that you had said and then it, 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 it can, I can kind of lose the, uh, the train of thought. We were talking about why why people comply when they have a child in the hospital with a birth certificate. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so it all starts with fear and faith, right? And this is back to the idea of there's two base emotions, love and fear. I don't like what the term love has turned into. There's a misunderstanding there, so we'll go with faith. If folks 
would understand that there is some program and plan and that we can run it without institutions, they would have faith in allowing that being to be born and not even bringing it to an institution. But everything starts and continues with a series of fears, right? So what I say is whether conscious or subconscious, and a lot of people don't like this, most people don't care enough to do the right thing, to search, seek truth, do what's true and what's right. It seems to be a lot easier and a lot more comforting to give responsibility and accountability over to someone else. And it's a very sick dynamic because the same way that people vote for presidents to destroy this country collectively and then blame it on the opposition is the same way people take their children, their, their, their state property is one version of what that word means, to a public school and allow them to be abused and tortured and poisoned and indoctrinated, then turn around and blame the school when they were supposed to be the ones to protect their own and didn't and failed. See, it's a lot easier when you're not response able and account able to just continue to throw your young ones into the fire of Moloch and Ammon and then blame them, right? It's a very, and, and again, a lot of people don't like that because it's a very dark dynamic. If you get into the subconscious and what's going on there, most people don't like themselves, don't really care about themselves. They don't care about their offspring, another interesting word. Right, it's, it's, it's animal terminology. So, you know, most people don't, and they're really okay. We'll give you the scripture. Many will look with their eyes and not see, with the ears listen and not hear, with the heart not get the sense of it. Most people in their heart have either been heartbroken, or their care has not been nurtured and activated to the point where they can really be willful and stand for what's true and what's right. So, like anything else, has to be worked like a muscle. When you see wrong being done, when you get activated from the inside out by conscience, which your God, whatever you believe that is, put that there, the universe put that there, you're supposed to use the word and speak on it and correct that wrong. If you continue to live a whole life of avoiding those moments because it's uncomfortable, it's embarrassing, it's fearful, you know, then you'll do that in every, you know, again, you are who you are in anything you do and everything you do. People show up to court timid, fearful, insecure, not willing to speak truth. So that's why they get controlled and dominated. Right. And, the, and we're taught not to trust our instinct. So as a, you take someone who's pregnant, for example, and you throw them into the allopathic medical system, what they're taught and told is that everything that they feel is probably erroneous or somehow is... Yeah, invalid it's not necessary so if you have a child of course you're going to go to the authority of the doctor and listen to whatever the doctor says because the doctor is educated mm -hmm. in in the normal sense of the word so we assume that the doctor has the best intentions for the infant and, and the mother so i think that's where a lot of this starts is that the erosion of this has not just been um, man, man's version or man's idea of himself or herself, but going into these systems and allowing these systems to have more authority over the man and the woman. I think that's what's fucked. You dictate reality, right? Exactly. I, I think that's what's is. fucked us up. And so <laughs> a, a woman who goes into a hospital to have an infant, it's a very fearful time. So if the doctor says, well, let's give him 12 vaccines and we're going to cut <laughs> off the head of the penis and we're going to do this and we're going to, you're just going to go along with it because you're in this very vulnerable, probably the most vulnerable state as a woman that you can be in and you're looking for an authority you're looking for guidance and you don't have a doula or you know three generations of of mother grandmother and great-grandmother there that are helping you walk through that so your community you know why that is also because it's a it's a feedback loop of look around you and tell me how many men true men that you have around you right how many men, how many women have to look to the state because they don't have men around them who will do what's true and what's right, regardless of outcome. Sure. You know, yeah. I'll wait because every other woman I talk to, when they really get real with themselves and me will say, 
you know, and this is not an egoic statement. They'll say, we need more men like you, Paul. And I say, it's not about that. You can play the ego game all you want. It, it, it's not about stroking my ego. I'm doing what's true and what's right, regardless of outcome. So it may be a true case. When every other man starts to do that, women will look to them as a state. But then women already know in their mind and heart and their genetics archetypally, they know these men ain't men. They've seen it. They've seen it too often, right? They know they're a walking paycheck. You know, they're a walking benefit and privilege. Just like the government, walking benefit and privilege. But who's the protector at the end of the day? Well, we've you know? emasculated men as a culture. We have um, degraded the divine feminine. So we've taken Absolutely. everything that's good about women. And now we're saying those criteria apply to men. So now men can have babies. Now men can have breasts. Now men can have manufactured vaginas. So what this has done is it's completely, completely eroded the humanness from both sexes. So now men don't know how to be a man and women don't know how to be a woman because that's not what society is telling you to do or be like taking care of your family is the worst thing that a woman could do or want to do like feed her children properly. Non-empowering. Exactly. Because she's, because she's giving up again, her legal person status, right? She's not in the corporate world now. She doesn't have the juice, you know, the electricity, the mammon, the Molex. She doesn't have the thing that makes the gears grind, right? Or the gears work. So, you know, again, this is all a culture, a cult of indoctrination that it talks about in scripture from day one, that the folks who worship in the groves, we can talk about Bohemian Grove and that whole thing. I know it's mm-hmm. conspiracy theory and all that. Oh. But the ones who worship in the groves bring about the, the, the owl, Molech, who sees in the dark mm-hmm. while the rodents get picked off. Yep. You know, it's Mammon and Molech. It's a system of corporate servitude where money is the highest value system. Right. And it replaces all principles because it is the thing that we create with and from. It is an extension of our thoughts, emotions and actions. You know, we go to bed and wake up seven, five days a week thinking about how we're going to produce that thing so we can get the things we need when the things we need have been provided to us through the universe and in our community. And then they'll say, oh, Paulie's a communist and a socialist while they're paying taxes and being socialized while they're in a collectivist mindset in demosocracy. Yeah. Well, right? 50, 50, 50% of this, of the culture wasn't being taxed. So that's one of the reasons we want to erode the family unit is we, th- those are employees that, that we could be taxing. And it also, I think another level of that, and Chris and I have talked about this ad nauseum, but I think another level of this is the vulnerability because what it's done is it's made uh, a male and or a female a, a man and woman child <laughs> in that family unit it's completely made them vulnerable to whoever whoever's influence if the mother is not home and the father's not you got both of the parents out working then the children are uh, more easy to indoctrinate into whatever system, school system, uh, media system you want them to get indoctrinated into because there's no one there. There's no checks and balances. There's no one there to observe. So basically what you're saying, this is a crazy idea of breakthrough right now. It's not supernatural for the mother and father to leave the nest and to take the child and put them in the hands of complete strangers yeah. who ironically enough have a complete bestial, bestial system that they want to continue to uphold and create. It's what we call a beast of burden, right? Sure. Burden that I have to uphold. So I've become lower in my frequency and consciousness to the point where I'm beneath an animal because an animal would never do this behavior. Exactly. This is why I say to people, you're killing animals who have enough common sense to know not to give their young ones over to sketchy humans. When I drive past the wild cows, they give me a side eye. It doesn't matter how many times they see us. They know what we're about. Right. So my question is, why are we demeaning animals who have an innate intuition and common sense to know you can get close with some of them sometimes, but don't get They're about genocide and slavery. How come the humans, the higher consciousness supposed beings, can't figure out the same thing about what they're creating themselves? 
and being a part of. It's fascinating to me. Well, that seems as good a place as any to call the first free hour. To hear the next hour and a half of this fantastic conversation, just go to patreon.com slash the melt podcast, where for as little as three measly dollars a month, you can hear full episodes, exclusive episodes, and early episodes, and also have access to monthly melt meetups. In the second hour, We talked about entertainment, the slave mentality, being response-able, dangerous freedom, dictating your own life, what it means to be a man and woman, and much, much more, plus Hunter and I's commentary. So, yes, great, great conversation, very motivating, and uh, yeah, definitely worth a listen. We're going to have Paul on again for sure. Uh, If you like what you hear and you're not into subscribing to Patreon on a monthly basis, you can visit our merch store. The link will be in the episode notes. And there you can just purchase something and that money will go to help um, make this podcast the center of our lives and you get something to show for it. Thank you all so very, very much for listening. It means so much to us. And uh, as usual, there is many, many great things uh, coming your way. And I hope that you glean something positive from this episode. I know that I did. Much love. Until next time. Take care, people. If you've liked what you've heard and would like to contribute to The Melt, there are a few ways that you can do that. The most tangible would be financially. Just click the Patreon link in the episode notes and there you will find ways that you can contribute for as little as $3 a month. This will give you access to bonus episodes, early access to regular episodes, and you can also participate in monthly Zoom meetups. Contributing financially will also help make the melt better, pay the bills, and help to make this podcast a full-time endeavor that I can fully devote my time to and provide you with more content. Another way of contributing would be to go to wherever it is that you subscribe to The Melt and give it a favorable review or rating, and this will help it to reach more people. You can also spread the word to friends and family via social media, email, or word of mouth. And lastly, if none of those options are readily available or appealing to you, simply send your positive thoughts and intentions. In an interconnected and quantumly entangled multiverse, these also go a long way. Thank you.